In this video, we will be going over the life and death of the Philadelphia crime family associate, Rocco Marinucci. This video will be based on the sources, Philip Leonetti's book, Mafia Prince, Inside the America's Most Violent Crime Family and the Bloody Fall of La Costa Nostra by Philip Leonetti with Scott Bernstein with Christopher Graziano. In addition, the book Blood and Honor Inside the Scarful Mob, The Mafia's Most Violent Family by George Anastasia. Rocco Marinucci Jr. was born in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania on January 20, 1952 to Rocco Marinucci Sr. and Mary Brignoli. He was a pizza shop owner and an operator in South Philadelphia. He was married to Sheila. Marinucci. However, he did live a double life in the night. He also worked in the criminal underworld. Rocco Marinucci was a Philadelphia crime family associate. In 1980, Philadelphia's godfather, Angelo Bruno, was brutally killed in front of his home. His successor, Philip Chicken Man Testa, took over the reign of the criminal underworld. However, just like Angelo Bruno, Testa's assassins will be planning on his murder. Rocco Marinucci will be one of those assailants. He worked as Peter Casella's chauffeur and bodyguard within the Philadelphia crime family, and he was recruited into the conspiracy to whack Philip Testa. On March 15, 1981, Philip Testa's life would change forever. He left his car double parked in the middle of the street in front of his house. Across the street from the Testa's double parked car was a black Volkswagen van. Inside the van sat Rocco Marinucci. As Testa's foot hit the front porch, Marinucci pushed the switch on a remote control detonator. Testa's reign as a mob boss ended in the blast that followed. Most likely he didn't feel a thing. The explosion happened in an instant. As Testa reached for his front doorknob, Marinucci pushed a button and he blew the chicken man into oblivion. Reverberations from the blast registered for miles. A bomb packed with nails and explosive erupted from under the porch where had been a hidden rocking homes and store within a 12 block area. Lights began to flick on and up and down the streets as neighbors rushed to find out what happened. For many, their first thought was there had been an explosion at the oil refinery tank from the farm nearby southwest Philadelphia. Marinucci was known on the streets as Pete Casella's driver and protege. Even if Testa had realized what was going on around him, he probably couldn't have done much. Fate was already in motion. From the second Testa got out of his car, he was on his crosshairs. Underneath his porch was a makeshift bomb made up of carpenter's nail and 13 sticks of dynamite rigged onto a handheld detonator in the possession of Marinucci. Tessa died after succumbing to his wounds. He would join his wife Althea, who had died a year prior to him. He was survived by his son, Salvatore Testa. He was more known in the streets as Salvi. As the darkness of night gave away to the blinding bright light of dawn, many would casually dismiss the event with a shrug as just as another mob hit. As the reader of Philadelphia Inquirer or the Daily News and sipped their morning coffee, but they were wrong. This was anything but just another mob hit. It was the death of a sitting mob boss. The second search that had killing had, had been taking place in the city of Philadelphia in less than a year as a complex struggle over money and power became deadly. The city of brotherly love had become the city of brotherly blood. The following year, New Jersey born American rock icon Bruce Springsteen will release a song about it immortalizing the event in pop culture lore. Well, I blew up the chicken last and I blew up his eyes to In the underworld, the killing of mob boss like Philip Chicken Man was akin to the assassination of a president. Like the earthquake that it resembled, the death of Philip Testa would produce systemic ripple effects and shake the foundation of the underworld in South Philadelphia and Atlantic City to its very core. The ensuing chaos will last for the next three decades. 
After Tesla's assassination, there was a mob meeting in South Philly. Rocco Marinucci was looking at one of the windows and listening to a police scanner. From here, we would start quoting Philip Leonetti's book, The Mafia Prince, and read it from his perspective. Philip Leonetti stated, The whole time we're sitting, the same guy who was running back and forth between Benny Eggs and the chin keeps coming and going, whispering to Benny each time he does. All of a sudden, the door opens and here comes Pete Casella, and he has Rocco Marinucci with him. Benny gets up to greet him, and Pete introduces Rocco as a friend of mine, which means he's not in the Costa Nostra. He's not made, and Benny's colors change, and he won't shake Rocco's hand. You can't bring him in here, Benny says to Pete, and one of the Genovese guys barked at Rocco, Go, wait in the car, and Rocco was out the door, and he never looked back. Towards the end of the night, I'm sitting at a table with my uncle and Chucky, and my uncle mentions to Salvi to come over. Michael says to Salvi, I think it's time. Salvi says, time for what, Nick? And Michael says, your father. And Salvi's eyes gets real big. Michael says, it's two guys, and he nods towards Chucky Narducci, who is standing a few feet away from us talking to some other guy at the bar. That's one of them. And the other one is that young kid with the pizza shop, Pete's friend. Salvi nods his head and he's staring straight ahead in Chicky Narducci's direction, almost like he's in a trance. My uncle says, you handle it how you see fit. I want you to do this for your father and for this family. Salvi's sitting there and his eyes had welled up with tears and he leans up and he leans in and hugs my uncle and gives him a kiss on the cheek. And he wiped his eyes and said, thank you, Nick. And then he got up and boom, he's out the door. I think his emotion had gotten the best of him. Now when my uncle became boss, he didn't come back to Philadelphia and he tells everyone what Pete Casella had said at the meeting with the chin and who was in on the Phil Tester murder. The word going around was the New York had Pete Casella a pass and that they had retired him to Florida and made my uncle the boss. That was it. That was that story. No one knew that Pete had given up Chicky and Rocco Marinucci except for my uncle. And the only people who he told were me, Chucky, and Lawrence. We knew, but no one else in the family knew. Now we're at the Christmas party and my uncle tells Salvi and he gives him the okay to kill both guys. It was a great way to end the new year. Salvi Testa had started 1982 off by killing Chicky Narducci, one of the men responsible for the bombing death of his father on March 15, 1981. The other killer, Rocco Marinucci, thought that Scarfo and Testa were unaware of his involvement in the Philip Testa murder. That's because guys in Salvi Testa's crew had been referring burglary jobs to Marinucci, who in addition to making pizzas and nail bombs, was also a renowned burglar. Right after Salvi killed Chicky Narducci, he went and grabbed Chicky's two sons, Frank and Philip, and brought them in. He told them, I killed your father because he killed my father. Now Frankie and Philip were around La Costa Nostra all of their life through their father, so they knew the rules. Frankie was a made guy, and he was a part of Salvi's crew. Now when Salvi tells them this, they knew there's nothing they can say or do about it. If they tried to retaliate or anything like that, we would have killed them both. And they knew it. So they accepted it for what it was and everyone moved on. Now at the time, Frankie Narducci was tight with this Rocco Marinucci, the kid who made the bomb. So Salvi's crew, which included both Narducci brothers, are feeding this Rocco little jobs. And Rocco and Salvi's guys are making money together and Rocco thinks he's in the clear, but this is a trap. Salvi's guys tell Rocco, we need you to help us open a safe. We think there's a couple million there. So Rocco and Salvi's guys go to the Buckeye Club in South Philadelphia, which is Frankie Narducci's place to go over the plan to get the safe and get the tools they needed. Rocco is thinking, this is it. This is the score of a lifetime. Now this whole time, Rocco is dealing with 
guys in Salvi's crew, but never Salvi himself. So they get to the club, they go inside, and the lights are out. Frankie says, must, must be a bad bulb. The other guys come in and Rocco is asking them if they brought flashlights so they can see, but the place is pitch black. Frankie says to Rocco, there's some flashlights in the back room and there's a light switch back there. See if there's working. Rocco finds a string hanging from the ceiling and pulls it and a dim light goes on. As Rocco turns around, instead of seeing the flashlights, he sees Salvi Testa, the Grim Reaper who will be striking again. Testa and his crew were known in the law enforcement circle as the young executioners, lived up to their name by Strand. Salvi told me afterwards that he bought a bag of M80s and cherry bombs like the firecrackers you see on the 4th of July. He wanted to torture this kid within an inch of his life and then when he was ready to kill him, he wanted to put the fireworks in his mouth and keep setting them off until he died. But the problem was the saliva in his mouth made it difficult to light the firecrackers. So they kept beating him and beating him and every time they wouldn't light. So finally Salvi pulls out a gun and empties it into this kid's head. Then they stuff three of the firecrackers into his mouth to send a message that the killing was payback for what happened to Salvi's dad. The firecrackers weren't the only message that Salvi, Testa, and his uncle extra cruisers would send. They purposely committed the murder on March 15, 1982, the one year anniversary of Philip Testa's death. In less than a year, Nicodema, little Nicky Scarfo, had established his verge ongoing organization as the most ruthless regime in history of the Philadelphia mob. Gone were the docile Donna days of Angela Bruno. Nicky Scarfo was a gangster, and the men around him were stone cold killers. This is exactly what my uncle wanted. He wanted people to be afraid of us, and they were. Everyone was scared to death, and for good reason. Scarfo and Leonetti had turned Atlantic City into the Wild West of the 1970s with several high prolific gangland killings, and now they were doing the same in the streets of South Philadelphia. When Scarfo and Salvatore Molino were summoned to the Buckeye Club in the night of Philip Tesla's wake, Casella, Narducci, and several other associates, including Casella's young protege, Rocco Marilucci, were waiting for him. Meanwhile, the police continued stumbling upon over the bodies of mobsters and mob associates. And although the police had questioned him about the Tesla contract, they were never able to gather enough evidence to link him to the bombing. Now, it didn't matter. This is timing and circumstances surrounding his death confirmed his involvement. Marinucci had been shot repeatedly in the head and chest. His hands were tied in front of his body with clothing line. His corpse was found on Federal Street in South Fork, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, in bullets wounds to the neck and chest and head. And here is some of the archive footage that we will show you now. Frank on the scene also knows that Marinucci's cheeks were puffed out. This turned out to be a message from his killer. Stuff inside Marinucci's mouth were three large unexploded firecrackers. The date was March 15, 1982, the first anniversary of the blast that killed Testa. Rocco Marinucci was 30 years old. He was survived by his wife, Sheila, and his parents. He is buried in the Holy Cross Cemetery, the same cemetery his victim and killer, the Testa family, are also buried there as well. This concludes our Philadelphia Crime Fairy story. This is Affiliate Productions. We look forward to you to watching our documentaries. Thank you for watching this video. Please be sure to subscribe to our channel and check out more of our content. Feel free to give your feedback and suggestions on who we should do next in the comments. This is Infinitely Productions. We love you.